Hello fellow problem solvers. So there are we doing a problem from the Dr. Math Olympiad 2009 problem number one. I suggest you try to solve this number theory problem that's a bit technical in nature for the next 30 minutes at the minimum, ideally an hour to hour, hour and a half, not more than two and a half hours. If you'd like to go along with us, give us a go for the next 15 minutes. What would you do? And now let's begin. So we have this equation and we need to solve the positive integers. Let's see, well, we have 9 minus 5, for example. Do we have anything else? 27 minus 25, no. 81 minus 5, no. Okay, so that could be the only thing. Maybe there are more things. But how do we approach these types of problems? And the answer is we usually look at some remainders. We look at modular arithmetic. For example, if we're looking at this, looking at, say, remainders 1 divided by 3. We can look at this modulo 3. We have that this side is going to be congruent to, well, this isn't divisible by 3, this whole thing, so this must be congruent to 1 modulo 3. Given a square can only be 1 or 0 modulo 3, and you do it, you can like write out uh, x can be 0, 1, or 2 modulo 3, and then x squared can be 0, 1, and 2 becomes 4, which is 1 modulo 3. So then we have, we need to have minus 5 to the y needs to be congruent to 1 modulo 3. In other words, 5 to the y needs to be congruent to minus 1 modulo 3. And now what does this imply? Well, this is minus 1 to the y must be congruent to minus 1 mod 3. That's what 5 is, so 2 doesn't divide y. We know that. Let's see if there's anything else. Say, look at modulo 5. We have this side is going to be either 0 either going to be 1 or minus 1, because if you look at x, say modulo 5, x and x squared, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and the possible things are 0, 1, minus 1, minus 1, a 9 is minus 1, or 4, and a 4 is 1, modulo 5. So we have 3 to the x, which goes, how does, what are its remainders? So say 3 to the first, is congruent to 3 modulo 5, 3 squared is 9, is congruent to minus 1, 3 to the third is minus 3, which is minus 2, which is equal to 2, modulo 5, and then 3 to the power of 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 5, this is 81, 81 gives a remainder 1, 1 divided by 5. And now what do we know from here? Well, we know that 2 divides x, because after this it's periodic. 3 to the 4k plus 1 is going to be congruent 3 to the 4th k times 3. This is congruent to 1 to the k modulo times 3 to the power times 3 modulo 5. And then this is congruent to 3 modulo 5. So this is periodic. You can prove it in this way. And now what we are going to be doing is saying, okay, we have this and we have this. And what are you going to do now? Pause for five minutes to think about how, what are you going to do here? And the answer is, well, you have a square here. And if you can write stuff as a difference of squares, that's sort of a thing. You have squares in number theory. Let's look at if I can write things out as a difference of squares. It's a heuristic, a rule of thumb. You try it out. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you look at quadratic residues when you have squares. If you have a cube, you might be looking at that. Here we look at, say, now we have x is equal to 2a for some integer a, and then we have this equation is 3 to the power of a squared minus z squared is equal to 5 to the power of y. Okay, now what do we do with this? Well, we write this as 3 to the x minus z times 3 to the x plus z is equal to 5 to the power of y. What do we have now? Well, we have a times b is 5 to the power of y. What are the prime factors of a and b? Well, they can only have fives as prime factors, or a one. Like, they, uh, they're either one or they have fives as prime factors, nothing else. So this is of the form of five to the alpha, and this is of the form of five to the beta, for some alpha and beta. Take z to be positive, like, z is a positive integer, actually. So we have this is less than this, right? Because z is a positive integer. In other words, alpha is less than beta. And alpha plus beta needs to be gamma. So now we have an equation which is of the form 3 to the power of a minus z is 5 to the alpha, 3 to the power of a plus z is equal to 5 to the beta. 
what do we do with this series of equations? Again, I invite you to pause for two to three minutes. See, what would you do here? The answer is you go ahead and you add them up or you can subtract them out. Like you subtract them out when you have these subs. When you have two equations like a minus b, a plus b, you either add or subtract to get what a and b is equal to. The reason you add here is because when you add, you get two times three to the a is equal to five to the alpha plus five to the beta. Now, what happens if alpha is greater than or equal to one? Well, the answer is then this side becomes divisible by five. However, this one does not have five as a prime factor, which means what? Well, that means that alpha needs to be equal to zero and beta is equal to y. So this equation now becomes three to the alpha minus z is equal to one. 3 to the alpha plus z is equal to 5 to the power of y. And from there, we also have that 2 times 3 to the power of a is equal to 5 to the power of y plus 1. Right? So this is what we have now. And you might be looking at, wait a second, can't I just now say z is equal to 5 to the y minus 1? and then plug that in here, and then I'll maybe get some estimates, right? You might be looking at that to say, couldn't I sort of finish up with that sort of easily? And to answer that question, I would say, maybe, right? Maybe, maybe that's actually the case that you could finish it up quite nicely there. Actually, Z would be five to the power of Y. Okay, Z would be equal to 5 to the power of y minus 1 over 2. And then when you took the 5 to the y here in this equation, you would get 3 to the power of x is equal to 5 to the power of y plus 1 over 2 plus, plus 1, everything plus 1 over 2, and then squared. And you would get to the same equation right here. So and if you look at z, z is sort of the thing as an, it's an afterthought, right? Once you, if you get an A and a Y that satisfy this, you can very easily pick a Z here. And right? if you pick Z is equal to literally three to the A minus one, you're done. Like you get this, both of these equations are satisfied. So this is what we now have to focus on. And how are we ever going to be looking at this? Well, let's think about it. For A is equal to one, we have a solution, right? We have a solution is six is equal to five plus one. And then for, now for nine, for, for two times nine, for two times, what's it called, 27, for two times 81, we don't seem to be getting a solution. So now we're thinking for a greater than or equal to two, in other words, when this is divisible by nine, could it be in fact the case that we just don't have a solution here, right? That's sort of like an intuition that's telling us, like maybe this is, in fact, what you need to prove. And the question is, okay, say this is true. Let me now look at a couple of modules. If I look at this modulo four, this is one plus one. This needs to be one. I have two is, two needs to divide a, right? I have yeah, two needs to divide a, because this is minus one to the power of a modulo four, and this is equal to two modulo four, this side. So a needs to be divisible by two now. If we're looking at this modulo four, do actually wait a second, am I completely wrong? Because for a is equal to one, I have a solution, so we must have made a mistake. So we're thinking about modulos. This is two modulo four. So it needs to be congruent to minus. If I'm looking at this modulo four, this is two. Oh, it can be it can be both odd and negative modulo four. Like they're both they both work modulo four actually. My bad. So th this actually happens quite often. Like you think, oh, I think I got it, and then you check. This is what I want to also show you that I done tons of these problems. And I still make some algebraic mistakes, like in modulos, like in remainders, like algebraic mistakes everywhere. But I double check my reasoning when I make something. And I will check, wait a second, does it hold true in this K 
case where I have specific numbers. And if it's not, then I'm like, wait a second, what am I missing? What am I missing? And then I notice, oh, I've made a mistake in my reasoning and my thinking. And that helps me do the problems correctly. So here, I'd invite you to pause for the next you know, five, actually pause for 10-ish minutes and then try to push the problem forward, uh, push the problem forward. And now let's continue on. So there are many ways we can go about this. One is, let me see modulo nine, what's happening with fives and y, because this is going to be divisible by nine. Let's see under what conditions is this divisible by nine. Now we know say that five to the, I believe, sixth will be congruent to one modulo nine. And we can you know, check this out, look at every single one of the remainders. And five to the third, which is 125, is going to be congruent to minus one modulo nine, if I'm not mistaken. So we have 125, 126 is divisible by nine. So this is minus one modulo nine, which tells us here that y is of the form 60 plus three for some not, for some non-negative integer, right? If, as long as this is divisible by nine. Now, a question is, if this is 60 plus three, if, if we get from modulo nine that this is 60 plus three, can we prove then that this number, which is in one instance going to be 126, is going to have some other prime factor outside of nine? Or another way of going about this is to say, is there some way we can now further factor this thing? So those are like the two sorts of ways of thinking. One way of thinking is, let me see if there's another prime factor that pops up that has a period of six or five and such that then we'll have another prime factor here that we just don't have here. So let's look at 126 for that. When we divide this by two, we get 63 uh, divided by nine and I get a seven. Okay, so then let me look at the seven always divide five to the power of 60 plus three plus one, right? So now let's look at five modulo seven. This is how I'm coming up with a seven. I was also thinking in the back of my mind, what has a period of six for uh, a number five to the y? I'm looking at, it has six plus one is a prime, a seven is a prime. So I know that five to the sixth is congruent to one modulo uh, seven as well. And then maybe five to the third is congruent to minus one, right? That's the sort of thinking. And in fact, if we look at five, say five to the first, five to the zero, squared, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and then we look at this modulo and modulo seven, we get five to the zero is one, then five is say, let's do minus two, minus two or five, it's the same thing. I'm then five squared is going to be 25, 25 is congruence to four, modulo seven? Yes, it also makes sense, the squared is going to be four. Then I am getting a minus one, right? 125 is minus one. And now I see, okay, so minus one, I'll get here, minus two, I'll get two, four, I'll get minus four, which is a three, and then I'll get a one again. So I get that if y is equal to 60 plus three, that implies that seven divides five to the 60 plus three plus one. And then this side is divisible by seven, but this side is not, which leads to it, which says if a was greater than or equal to two, well, what it led us to is to say that then y is of the form 60 plus three. But if y is of the form 60 plus three, then we have seven divides five to the C, uh, 60 plus three plus one. But seven divides this side, doesn't divide this side. Boom, 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 contradiction. I mean, or impossibility. I, actually, I'm not sure. A contradiction actually is maybe an apt way of saying what is happening here. And this gives us that a greater than or equal to two doesn't have a solution, which means a is less than or equal to one. 
for a is zero. Why can we have a is zero? If we were to have a is equal to zero, this would mean x is equal to. Like we would get z is equal to zero, but this is not a positive integer, so forget about a is equal to zero, but a is equal to one gives us y is equal to a is equal to one implies y is equal to one and it also implies x is equal to two and so then this implies this equation z is equal to two as well and this is then the only solution in the positive integers this is a technical problem and it goes to show like there's many ways we could go about this another way was to say okay this is 60 plus 3 let me now factor this as 5 to the 2t plus 1 to the power of 3 plus 1. And now I can factor this, I call this number, say, q. Now this is q plus 1 times q squared minus q plus 1. And now I have one of these, like this number is equal to 2 to the power of 3 to the, say, L and this is 3 to the power of K. And now from here, there could be potentially another. Now, what I have actually, let me make this very clear. I have now, what is this going to be? This is going to be, well, actually, I might be able to do an infinite descent sort of argument here. Like, let's take the smallest. Um, solution with a is greater than or equal to 2, the smallest a, and correspondingly that gives us the smallest y. And then from here, I would get that there is a smaller, what's it called, a smaller a and y pair, right? I would get that actually 5 to the power of 2t plus 1 plus 1, which is this thing right here, is equal to 3 to the power of some l, where l is less than a is equal to two times three to the power of l actually where l is less than a and then this gives us a smaller solution or we can even maybe not a smaller solution then we can say well then this implies if we had the smallest solution this implies that l needs to be less than or equal to what's it called l is at least l needs to be at least um at least one l needs to, actually l needs to be equal to one i was thinking can l be zero it can't then l is one and then we have t is equal to zero for our smallest solution but then we get a contradiction that this actually does not end up working out so we could even do sort of a infinite descent sort of thing or potentially even look at this as then we have q squared minus q and this is q times q minus 1, which I can plus 1. And this is equal to 3 to the k. And this is, in fact, equal to 2 by this thing right here is equal to 2 times 3 to the l minus 1 times 2 times 3 to the l minus 2 plus 1. And then this is equal to 3 to the k. And now we have only powers of 3 on the board. And then we can have some sort of bounding argument like, where are there no 3s? We have a minus 1, minus 2, which gives us a plus 3 here. Then we would divide everything by 3 on both sides, 3 to the k and 3 to the l. And then we'd have something like, then we get what l needs to be equal to. And from there on, we could get to another sort of contradiction, right? So that, those are like the many sort of ways, shapes and forms that you could go about trying to prove that there is no other solution. And this finishes up our technique, a nice little problem from the Balkan Math Olympiad of 2009. And as always, thanks for problem solving.